um, 95% of the time it will reach the enzyme where it will, for instance, split water, ultimately, um, without being dissipated. And so this is this is remarkable in nature, and it and, and, it's, and, we, and you know, it takes us much longer to produce technology that you know, is so efficient as this. Hi, this is Dr. Jed Macosco at Wake Forest University and Academic Influence. Uh, we have today here Greg Schools from Princeton University, who's a famous chemist and originally from Australia. So tell us, uh, Greg, how did you end up going from Australia to the university uh, in New Jersey, Princeton? Uh, what was that trajectory like? Um, yeah, it was a it was around the world trajectory, I would say. Um, so at the time, there was uh, less information on the internet. You know, email was new, and so on. <clears throat> it wasn't that long ago, um, by the way, that this was the case. <clears throat> um, but in, in the typical route was, um, I'm an Australian. I should go to England, and so I did that for a postdoc at Imperial College, and it was there that I met Graham Fleming um, uh, from. UC Berkeley, and um, ended up doing a postdoc with him. So then I went from London to Berkeley, and from there, um, University of Toronto for my first faculty position. I was 14 years as a Canadian, and more recently, I moved to Princeton, New Jersey. So you know, there's, there's the route. That's really fun to hear about your different stops along the way. Um, did you also do your PhD in Melbourne? Yes, that's right. Yeah, my PhD was in Melbourne. Wonderful. So you really went all around, and it did seem like uh, those that first research project that you did as an undergraduate got you hooked on the idea of the exploration. What was that first research project that you did? Um, it was it was actually um, photochemistry um, or photophysics of these. Um, these fascinating molecules where there were two light absorbing molecules typically tethered by a chain and we wanted to study how they interacted after absorbing light but i mean i knew nothing about molecules absorbing light or the experiments that were to be done or anything but i just remember the postdoc who explained the project to me he filled a blackboard with drawings of potential energy surfaces molecular structures and goodness knows what. <clears throat> and at the end of it, I had no idea what the project was about, but he was so excited. I figured it must be good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's great. Was, was it fluorescent resonance energy transfer between the two dye molecules or was it just, uh, what were you studying? At that point, it was, it was not, it was a precursor to that, that the, um, there was, it was to do with um, a photochemistry, actually a reaction where when you excite, <clears throat> one half of these systems, which are like a, they can form a sandwich and come together and form chemical bonds between them. Um, and it was to study that. And there was some you know, pretty interesting molecules and they form these butterfly molecules at the end. Oh, cool. Yeah. That is so cool. Well, now what are you working on that might have application to sort of the average Joe on the street? Like you, you mentioned uh, OELDs and uh, quantum dot you know, screens, what, what role have you had in some of those developments? Yeah, I think that's a, um, you know, that would be helpful for people understand where did it, where does this technology come from? Because it wasn't so long ago. I remember going to a conference, maybe it was um, um, 2002. And at this conference, there were people speaking and then they would bring out a little piece of plastic and a battery and wire that piece of plastic to the battery and it would shine bright orange. And it was an OLED. <clears throat> um, and, you know, how far have we come now? We have the TVs that work on this. But, you know, the, the, the point of the story, I think, is that even though there was this device that had been discovered, um, it was very far from being able to go to market. And there was all sorts of quite technical scientific questions that, People had to wrap their head around, um, and I can give it. If, if you like, I can give a quick example of sure, one. Sure, especially as it pertains to your research, because you know we want to get to know you and your lab. So go ahead. 
Um, yeah, okay. Well, I, I mean, I assume you're editing this. I haven't, <clears throat> I think it's a good example for the general public. We've worked sort of around this area, but not specifically on it. But should I still go, go for and, it? Yes. Yeah. I think, <clears throat> yeah. So, one, I mean, <clears throat> one of the issues with these um, systems is because of um, some statistics in quantum mechanics already sounds complicated. Turns out when you inject charges into the plastic <clears throat> and the two charges, the plus and minus, come together in a particular way at a centre um, that will eventually emit light, a molecule, um, only one time out of four can they come together in such a way that they can emit that light. And so the efficiency of the device was low. It was not comparable to what... Um, um, what else we could do in technology at that time. And so that had to be overcome. Um, and the way that it was overcome that's used now, I think, in your iPhone was to flip the whole story on its head and to say, well, what if we could get light out of the three quarters of those they're called recombinations that are dark in this plastic that I told you about? And the key was simply to to say, okay, we can do that if we if we take a different material um, that instead of being dark three quarters of the time, it's bright three quarters of the time and dark one quarter of the time. <clears throat> and it was those molecules that were prepared that that um, you know, changed the technology. And so that's you know, great. It, so it, so it, so the ones that are in our phone right now. Uh, work three out of four times whenever there's a c combined charge. Oh, that's wow. That's great. So it, it uh, increased the efficiency by a factor of three just by using a different kind of material. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Fascinating. Now, again, how does your lab relate to all this? Because we know you're one of the most famous influential chemists, according to our algorithm. Um, and we know you've been doing amazing things. But what, what, what is that kind of stuff you've been working on? Yeah, so when it, you know, there's all sorts of processes that happen once you have light or charge. But let's talk about light in a complex material. And so this could be in the proteins that capture light in photosynthesis. It could be in these plastics that emit light. Um, <clears throat> and it's called when you have this photo excited molecule. What does it do? Well, it turns out it can that energy can jump between the molecules. Um, and it can jump thousands of times before that light comes back out. <clears throat> and this is important um, in the OLEDs um, because if that if that excited state encounters a quenching site, what's called some kind of impurity that takes the energy and just dissipates it as heat, then the device will be inefficient. In fact, the jumping of the energy called energy transfer is so effective that it would that those impurities would um, would dominate what happens um, uh, in photosynthesis. Um, that would also be a problem. So in photosynthesis, one needs to um, absorb light in any of the chlorophylls. There's hundreds of them around the enzyme that needs to be sensitized with that the energy from that light, and that energy will jump from molecule to molecule, and it's hard to imagine on this scale, of the molecular scale in these proteins, but it will jump thousands of times. And 95% um, of the time, it will reach the enzyme where it will, for instance, split water, ultimately, um, without being dissipated. And so this is this is remarkable in nature. And it, and, and it's, and we, and, you know, it takes us much longer to produce technology that you know, is so efficient as this. But I study how this happens. Mm. You study the jumping or um, how it's quenched, or which which part do you mainly focus on? Um, all all of them are similar processes, I have to say. But I do focus on the the jumping. Um, okay. For instance, um, how quick can these jumps be? Um, what limits how far you can go? Can you bring um, quantum mechanics into play to um, make these systems more efficient? If so, what does that look like? How can we understand it? It's these kinds of questions. 
Mm, wonderful. And when you say bring to bear quantum mechanics, do you mean quantum mechanical simulations done on computers to try to figure out how to make it more efficient? Or what did you mean by that? Right. So we do indeed use quantum mechanical modeling to study this um, in order to get a, in order to, to, what that does is it takes experimental data, which is somewhat abstract, of course, it's done in the lab. And it relates it to what might happen if we drew pictures showing all the molecules and the atoms. And that's the importance of that. And that enables us to make these quantitative comparisons across the scales. But um, questions, there have been questions for many decades about the precise mechanism of many of these fast processes, um, electron transfer, this energy transfer. Um, questions being, um, does it really happen, as I said, like a random jump of processes? Um, or could there be some interesting correlations there um, that, um, that make it a bit more challenging to work out or, or to be able to predict how these systems work and how to optimize them? And that's where quantum mechanics can come into play. That's great. Well. Um, I'm sure that your students really get to know the systems that you're looking at. Each one is, I'm sure, very different. Um, have any of the systems you've studied made it into commercial uh, uses, or uh, do you study ones that other people have found to be useful in commercial uses, and you, you study them? What's the relationship between what you and your students have done and what went to market? Um, I think... Most of what most of what we study is is fundamental. It's it's enabling in many times um, uh, future technologies in the sense that there's a lot there's a lot of work that has to be done in the trenches ahead of time before something can become a, de a device. As I said, there's a lot of questions, a lot of problems that you need to clean up. Like I said, with the LEDs. Um, nevertheless, we have worked also on some materials preparations um, in um, just in, in other, for other other reasons, and, and these um, these have been patented and I think commercialized. Very cool. Well, it is true that there's so many like basic fundamental questions that need to be resolved. And what would you say was sort of the most exciting one that you and your lab uh, figured out? Uh, that you're like, wow, now the world knows that this is how it works. Is there one that you can share with us today? Um, probably not, to be honest, that, that, that would be <laughs> uh, of interest um, to most people. I think the thing about, I think oftentimes what happens in science is that the work you're most excited about. Um, if you zoom out, it, it is pretty specialized and that your appreciation for why it matters and you know, why, why it was um, a big achievement is just because you've studied that problem for so long, decades maybe, mm -hmm. you have the perspective that you know, this is an important, an important problem to resolve or important observation to make. So, you know, we've done many, I would say a group has done a lot of experiments that have shown, um, shed light on, on, on things we could never have predicted um, and certainly didn't initially understand. And maybe this is, you know, more interesting uh, is, is that, and the value of this basic research is that is discovering something that you, you know, you never, could have imagined would have been there. It doesn't have to be super complicated, but just surprising. And then that, after that, and you understand it, you know, it unfolds a whole new appreciation for how how things work and what might be possible because of that knowledge. And so we've definitely done experiments that were surprising or that I didn't believe. Um, and then it turns out the explanation can be beautiful and like so elegant. And it makes sense in hindsight. At mm. the time, it sounded ridiculous. 
Wow, that's amazing. Well, uh, I'm sure for the people who care most about your field, those particular stories would be truly inspiring, you know, to see after all those years, you finally got it to work. After all those years, you finally found an answer and it wasn't the one you expected, but it makes it so elegant. So we're just glad you're working on these things. And we're so thankful that you could take some time to explain a little bit of what you're doing. Um, thank you for taking the time today. It was really nice to have you with us. Thank you. Pleasure. Yeah, thanks, Jim.